Today we're talking about a book named Make It Stick, which focuses on effective memory retention techniques. The subtitle, The Science of Successful Learning, explores the scientific principles behind learning effectively. After reading this book, I had several eye-opening realizations. For example, back in high school, many of my female classmates would meticulously highlight and annotate their textbooks, making them look vibrant and well-studied. I know a lot of people enjoy using highlighters for this purpose. In contrast, my textbooks would look untouched, almost brand new, because I never wrote or highlighted anything in them. However, when test time rolled around, I consistently outperformed them. They would often say it's not fair, attributing my higher scores to natural intelligence. In reality, it's not that I'm naturally smarter, it's that my approach to learning is more effective. The book's research suggests that excessive note-taking or highlighting can actually hinder memory retention. We often think that diligent note-taking and repetition will help us remember, but that's not necessarily the case. That's why I believe this book is essential reading. It addresses the challenges children face in learning, offering methods to make the learning process more efficient and scientifically grounded. It helps students quickly understand the relationships between different concepts, leading to significant improvements in academic performance. This is crucial for everyone, not just students. I consider this book to be an advanced version of PEAK, Secrets from the New Science of Expertise. It suggests that, with around 10,000 hours of focused practice guided by the 3F principle, you can become highly proficient in any skill. The book goes into greater detail about the concept of deliberate practice, challenging and expanding upon it, making it a valuable resource for anyone looking to improve their learning techniques. The book kicks off with a gripping story about a pilot named Matt Braun. During a flight, he suddenly faced an engine failure, causing the plane to tilt due to the imbalance of power. In that critical moment, he had to rapidly draw upon his stored knowledge to make life or death decisions. He had to quickly assess the weight of the cargo on board and determine whether a single engine could handle it. Should he try to restart the failed engine and what would be the risks involved? What would be the optimal angle for a successful restart and what complications could arise if it failed? Through a series of quick, complex maneuvers, he managed to safely land the plane. The takeaway here is that in real-life situations like piloting a plane, you don't have the luxury of time to Google solutions or even consult a manual. You have to rely on your internal reservoir of knowledge for immediate problem solving. Simply storing information in your brain isn't sufficient. You need to develop it into an actionable mental framework that can be automatically accessed and applied. Only then can you say you've truly mastered a subject. The journey to forming a mental model is essentially the process we all go through when learning a new skill. One of the most surprising findings, backed by extensive psychological research, is that repetitive reading is largely ineffective for learning. Why does this happen? Continuous reading creates a false sense of mastery, making us believe we've retained the information. This illusion is particularly strong when you annotate your notes with colorful highlights. It's akin to the Google effect, where the ease of finding information online makes us less likely to remember it. This false sense of understanding is exemplified in what's known as the repeated reading test. Educators, in collaboration with psychologists, conducted various tests comparing two groups of learners. The first group continuously read the material, while the second group read it once and revisited it a week later. The results showed that the latter group had significantly better memory retention and higher test scores. What's even more effective than revisiting the material after two weeks 
taking a quiz on it. Providing a retrieval opportunity such as a brief quiz can dramatically boost memory retention. Why does this work? It's because of a cognitive function called metacognition, which is our ability to assess our own understanding. Metacognition is often skewed, leading even the most diligent students into two common traps. First, they may not recognize their learning gaps, unsure where to focus their efforts for improvement. Second, they often resort to ineffective study techniques that give them a false sense of mastery, like excessive note-taking, underlining, highlighting, and repetitive reading. The psychologist points out that many students prefer repetitive learning methods because they're less challenging. What's challenging is when your brain has to struggle to recall information, which can be uncomfortable. Whether or not you manage to recall it, the effort itself aids in deeper understanding. This concept is termed retrieval in the book. The reason both teachers and students often resist retrieval-based learning is that it can be uncomfortable. While exams are generally disliked due to the stress and pressure they bring, they are actually highly beneficial for memory retention. Introducing even a small element of cognitive challenge and active retrieval can significantly enhance learning outcomes. An experiment conducted in a Columbia City, Illinois middle school serves as a case in point. Eighth graders were given low stakes quizzes with immediate feedback on their performance. These quizzes covered minor topics in their science class and accounted for only three credits. Another set of topics not covered in the quizzes was reviewed three times by the students. This latter set served as the control group. A month later, during a major exam, it was observed which set of topics was better retained by the students. In the major exam, students who had been quizzed on certain topics scored an average grade of A, while those who had only reviewed the material without quizzes scored a C+. This significant gap highlights the effectiveness of retrieval-based learning methods in reducing metacognitive biases. The conclusion here is clear. The more effortless the learning process, the less effective it is. Those who seem diligent, constantly reading and annotating, may appear to be hard-working, but are actually engaging in less effective learning methods. They spend a lot of time on tasks that are not cognitively challenging. A fitting metaphor for this is the idea of tying knots in a chain of knowledge. Continuously reading and taking notes without testing is like endlessly smoothing out a chain without tying any knots. It's the act of taking tests that ties these knots, solidifying the information in your memory. This key insight from the book underscores the importance of challenging ourselves in the learning process. Next, let's discuss what is termed post-peak, which highlights the advancements this book makes over the book peak. One case study involved two groups practicing throwing bean bags into a basket three feet away. One group practiced exclusively from the three-foot distance, as that would be the distance tested later. The other group was never allowed to practice from three feet, but alternated between two and four feet. After a rigorous 12-week practice period, both groups were tested on their three-foot throws. Surprisingly, the group that practiced at varying distances outperformed the one that practiced solely at three feet. Why is that? Based on the principles of focus, feedback and fix-it advocated in peak, one might assume that continuous specialized practice would yield the best results. However, the authors of this book, who collaborated on the research, found that practicing at varying distances actually led to better performance when tested at the three-foot mark. Why could this be? Consistent, focused practice often leads to short-term memory retention. When you've practiced to the point where it feels automatic, you're not really engaging your brain in a meaningful way. 
To improve learning and memory retention, it's essential to introduce time and content intervals into your practice sessions. For example, in medical training, doctors learn the intricate skill of suturing capillaries. In one study, half of the doctors completed all four training sessions in a single day, which is the standard approach. The other half completed the same four sessions, but with a week's gap between each. A month after the training, the doctors were tested on various metrics, including surgical time, hand movements and success rates. Those who had training sessions spaced out over weeks significantly outperformed their peers who had crammed all sessions into one day. Furthermore, 16% of the doctors who completed all sessions in one day ended up damaging other blood vessels in the lab mice, failing to successfully complete the surgery. Why is Spacedot practice more effective than cramming? Likely because the brain needs time to consolidate new information into long-term memory. This consolidation process deepens the neural pathways associated with the new knowledge, linking it with existing information, and can take several hours or even days. So, when you try to recall this information after some time has passed, it requires more mental effort, re-triggering the consolidation process and strengthening the memory. This is why incorporating time gaps or varying training activities can significantly improve learning outcomes. This concept is one of the reasons this book is seen as an extension of the principles of deliberate practice. Next, let's explore the learning process for something that's high stakes, where failure isn't an option because it could be life-threatening. The book uses skydiving as an example to illustrate this point. The methodology for teaching skydiving is almost universally standardized. Why? Because the stakes are incredibly high and you can't afford to make mistakes. You can't just start by jumping out of a plane. There has to be a structured, scientifically backed progression to ensure you truly master the skill of skydiving. So, how is this achieved? I'm sure many are curious about how skydiving is taught, even if you have no plans to try it yourself. In skydiving training, the first rule is that note-taking is off-limits. The focus is on listening, observing, mentally practicing, and then executing the moves. Skydiving schools primarily use ongoing quizzes as a teaching method. Simply put, if you can't pass the quiz, you're out. These quizzes are designed to continually assess and drive your learning. In military jargon, the rolling landing technique is known as PLF. This allows you to roll in multiple directions upon landing, forward and backward, to the left or right. Depending on various factors like your landing orientation, the terrain, wind direction, and whether you're swinging upon impact. Initially, you'll practice this PLF technique in a sand pit under the guidance of an instructor a week. Later, the stakes are raised. You'll have to jump from a platform two feet off the ground. Even if you're not great at it, it's a low-risk jump. As you advance, the tests get tougher. You'll need to climb up a zip line hold on to a T-handle above your head and glide down to your landing spot. Once there, you release the handle, land and execute the PLF roll. As you continue to master the rolling technique, you'll eventually find yourself on a 12-foot platform, which can be a bit nerve-wracking. Here, you'll practice strapping into your harness and conducting gear checks with your fellow trainees. You'll also simulate a jump from an airplane door, complete with all the straps and gear you'd use in an actual skydive before gliding down a zip line. In the end, it's the instructor who releases the zip line, allowing you to drop from a modest height and practice your rolls in various directions. Next, you'll ascend a 34-foot parachute tower to rehearse every aspect of an airplane jump. 
From the sensation of high altitude gliding to dealing with equipment malfunctions and parachuting with heavy combat gear. By this stage, the training becomes incredibly lifelike. You're on a 34-foot tower, steadily improving your skills. Once these maneuvers become second nature, forming your mental model, you'll be ready to board a plane as a paratrooper and join a 30-person team for a large-scale aerial drop. So, what's the point of breaking down the skydiving training process? The idea is to understand that learning anything, even something as risky and intricate as skydiving, boils down to three key phases. First, there's encoding, where you mentally categorize what you're seeing. For instance, if you've never skydived and you see people practicing rolls on the ground for their parachute landing fall, PLF, you need to mentally tag these actions, understanding their purpose and significance. This initial phase is all about encoding this new information into your mind. Next comes consolidation, which is all about reinforcing these mental tags. Through a cycle of forgetting, testing and repeated practice, you solidify these mental representations. This allows you to perform these actions almost instinctively without having to think about them consciously. This is the consolidation phase. Finally, there's retrieval, the ability to recall and apply what you've learned. These three phases, encoding, consolidation and retrieval, are essential for mastering any complex skill. Additionally, when acquiring new skills, you might need to unlearn old habits. For example, if you're used to driving a tractor, you might find it challenging to adapt to driving a car due to ingrained habits. This is where the importance of forgetting comes into play. When you manage to set aside what you've previously learned, you make room for absorbing new knowledge. Forgetting doesn't mean erasing it entirely. It often means relegating it to your subconscious, just temporarily not calling upon it. Take, for example, Marcel Proust's literary classic, In Search of Lost Time. While not many have read the entire tome, it's famous for its opening, where the scent of a lime-blossom tea-soaked cake triggers a flood of childhood memories for the author. This is a prime example of how our subconscious can be reactivated. So, the essence of learning involves setting aside old knowledge in our subconscious to make way for the new. Interestingly, the easier something is to recall, the less likely we are to remember it in the long run. That's why the learning process requires effort, especially in the initial stages of memory consolidation. This is achieved through retrieval exercises, testing and ongoing challenges. The next step in the learning process is creating mental models. This involves taking the memories you've solidified and being able to instinctively act upon them, much like how a trained skydiver would automatically know what to do when jumping from a plane. Then there's the skill of extrapolating from a single instance to broader applications. Take Leonardo da Vinci, for example, who I've been learning about through Leonardo da Vinci, Flights of the Mind. Da Vinci was a master at this. He'd see birds soaring in the sky and start contemplating the similarities between avian flight and fish swimming. Despite the water's resistance, fish seem to move even more swiftly than birds. Puzzled by this, he eventually laid the groundwork for fluid dynamics, making him one of its earliest pioneers. Da Vinci's curiosity didn't stop there. Observing the curl of a person's hair led him to consider its similarities with the swirling patterns of a vortex. This ability to draw connections allowed him to capture the intricacies of both water vortices and hair curls in his artwork. This skill of making broader connections from a single observation is what we call the ability to generalize. Next up is conceptualization, this involves gaining a deep understanding of what something is called 
and why it has that particular name. What's the relationship between these elements? Lastly, there's the idea of learning transfer. This means taking what you've absorbed from your reading and applying it to your everyday life, making it an integral part of your existence. So why am I such a fan of this book? Because it offers answers to questions. My friends often ask me about effective learning methods. The book is a treasure trove of insights on this topic. Another intriguing point is the concept of benign interference, which seems to enhance learning outcomes. What does that mean? Some people noticed that the textbooks provided by the educational authorities were subpar with blurry text, water stains and even typos. Many criticized the poor quality, but an interesting pattern emerged. Students who used these flawed books actually scored better in their exams than those with pristine copies. Why could that be? Subsequent tests revealed that when the text is a bit fuzzy or the font is somewhat challenging to decipher, people tend to remember the article's content better. It appears that when the course syllabus doesn't align with the textbook, students are forced to work harder to grasp the course's essence which aids in better content retention. Another unexpected finding was that when words in a text are missing letters requiring the reader to fill them in, it slows down reading speed but strengthens memory retention. In all these cases, deviating from the standard presentation format introduces difficulties that disrupt the learning flow. However, these challenges prompt learners to work harder at constructing a sensible understanding, a phenomenon termed benign interference. While benign interference can enhance learning, it's crucial to note that if the difficulty level becomes too extreme, making the content incomprehensible or the challenges insurmountable, it won't aid learning. For example, if the text is so challenging that you can't recognize a single word or see anything clearly, it becomes counterproductive. Like, if I were to suddenly take up learning Latin, it would be quite a hurdle. I might manage if I stick to learning a daily Latin phrase, but diving into Latin articles right away would likely hamper my learning progress. Another point of caution is the growing educational trend that advocates for allowing children to dictate their own learning pace. The belief is that kids inherently know how to learn and will naturally find their own direction. This notion is risky. Why? Because it overlooks the inherent conflict between what Daniel Kahneman describes as System 1 and System 2 in the learning process. We've delved into this topic extensively in this book and you can find more on our homepage. System 1 represents our intuitive, emotional side, while System 2 embodies our rational, analytical side that requires tools for research and calculation. So, what role does System 1 play in influencing our learning? In 1985, a flight from Taipei to Los Angeles experienced engine failure. The crew attempted to restart the engine, unaware that the plane was actually in a nosedive, a situation known as spatial disorientation. This issue has been the cause of numerous plane crashes. The crew, trusting their gut feeling, or System 1, believed the plane was flying level and assumed the altimeter was faulty when they saw it dropping. It wasn't until the plane broke through the cloud cover and the ground came into view that the crew realized their grave mistake. In a desperate move, they managed to pull the plane back up just before it hit the ground. The force was so intense that it blew off the covers of the landing gear. When the plane eventually made an emergency landing, its wings were irreparably damaged. The incident serves as a testament to the plane's build quality, but also as a cautionary tale about the dangers of relying solely on intuition. What can we learn from this aviation incident? Even highly trained professionals like pilots can fall victim to their intuitive thinking 
or System 1, which may not always align with reality. This brings us to the topic of memory distortion, which can have significant implications for learning. For instance, a woman was attacked in her home. When asked by the police to describe her assailant, she provided details that led to the arrest of a man named Thompson. However, Thompson had an alibi. He was live on TV at the time of the attack. It was later verified that he was indeed broadcasting live. So why did the woman's description match Thompson so closely? She had been watching his live TV broadcast before the attack and her mind mistakenly associated him with her attacker. This case illustrates the potential pitfalls of memory distortion and its impact on our ability to learn accurately. So, if we let kids take full control of their learning journey, there's a good chance they'll fall into cognitive traps like misjudging time or having an inflated sense of their own abilities. The best way to gauge your own learning progress, hands-on practice and regular testing. Why? Because when you square off against experts, you get a reality check that helps minimize the errors your intuitive thinking might make. Another tip is to practice in conditions as close to real life as possible, although that's easier said than done. Take police training for disarming assailants, for example. Officers usually practice this with a partner, taking turns pointing a gun and disarming each other. But this training method led to a comical yet dangerous situation. An officer successfully disarmed, a criminal but then instinctively handed the weapon back to him. The criminal was dumbfounded and the officer had to disarm him again. This real-life incident highlights the importance of realistic training scenarios. The reason for the police officer's blunder was that his training didn't fully replicate real-world conditions. In a genuine confrontation, you'd never hand the gun back to the assailant. The officer had practiced this move so much that it became automatic, including the problematic step of returning the gun. This serves as a cautionary tale about the role of intuitive thinking, or System 1, in our learning journey, it can sometimes lead us astray. The book also delves into the subject of intelligence, debunking the myth that a low IQ hampers learning. IQ isn't set in stone, it's a relative measure. For instance, an IQ score of 120 today doesn't mean the same thing as it did a decade ago. IQ is calculated based on your standing within the current population. And it's worth noting that human intelligence is on the rise. Some people might not ace IQ tests, but excel in practical life skills. So, don't sweat too much about IQ. Modern understanding of intelligence recognizes different facets, like analytical, creative, and practical smarts. Analytical intelligence is what you use for learning and academic tasks, like studying for exams. Creative intelligence might not be the best fit for standardized tests, but is crucial for innovative thinking. Take Leonardo da Vinci, for example. He never had formal education, but was a powerhouse of creative genius. Practical intelligence is your knack for solving real-world problems effectively. These are three distinct types of intelligence, and when it comes to measuring them, the book's author recommends dynamic testing over static testing. Why? Because static tests can pigeonhole you into a fixed mindset. For instance, if you're labeled with an IQ of 75, that's not a life sentence. People evolve, and that's why dynamic testing is the way to go. So, what's dynamic testing? It's a type of IQ test that not only measures your intelligence, but also guides you on how to improve. Each time you take this test, you get insights into your strengths and weaknesses, allowing you to focus on areas that need improvement. This way, you can track your progress over time and build your knowledge base, much like stacking Lego blocks to create a structure. 
the importance of having a well-structured knowledge base can't be overstated. Many people read books but have no idea how to integrate them into their lives, which means they can't effectively remember or apply what they've read. This happens because they lack a cohesive framework for their knowledge, something that should be built piece by piece, like a Lego tower. Finally, we advocate for the concept of lifelong learning. Why? Because the human brain is a marvel. At birth, we have around 100 billion neurons, and these nerve cells are the building blocks of our cognitive abilities. Neurons in the brain communicate through connections known as synapses. In the early stages of life, there's a surge in the formation of these synapses. Neurons extend tiny branches, or axons, which seek out dendrites on other neurons. When an axon and a dendrite meet, a synapse is formed, essentially creating a stop or station in the brain's neural network. From ages one to two, the number of synapses in the brain peaks, reaching levels about 50% higher than in adulthood. This number stabilizes until adolescence, after which some synapses are pruned away, especially as the rate of new synapse formation slows. By age 16, the brain has matured with a staggering 150 trillion synapses. This explains why teenagers often have agile minds and can learn quickly although they may lack a structured framework for their knowledge, leading to enthusiasm but also disorganization. As we age, some of these synapses are lost, resulting in a more organized and rational mind. Our cognitive abilities are shaped by a mix of genetic and environmental factors, including personality traits, curiosity, and even our family background. It's worth noting that while genetics may make a child a bit more curious than their peers, if that curiosity is nurtured by the environment, the child could become significantly more intelligent. So, if boosting IQ quickly isn't an option, are there any strategies that can serve as intelligence amplifiers? Absolutely. Embracing a growth mindset, practicing in a manner similar to experts, and creating memory cues can all serve as multipliers for our cognitive abilities. In other words, the role of genetics in determining our intelligence is relatively minor unless you have a medical condition affecting your brain. However, the environment can have a major impact, as evidenced by studies on identical twins raised in different settings. These studies show that the environment can lead to dramatic differences in intelligence, personality, and learning capabilities. So, we can't just point fingers at our genetics or our environment. Those are out of our hands. What we can control is adopting an expert-like mindset. What does that entail? When Michelangelo completed the hundreds of figures on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, he was hailed as a genius. But he had a thought-provoking response. If people knew the amount of effort I've put into honing this craft, it wouldn't seem so miraculous. We all crave the label of genius, feeling that it's more prestigious to be seen as naturally gifted rather than hard-working. However, even icons like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci achieved their greatness through focused practice and a growth mindset. This book, along with Peak and Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, should be essential reading for students and educators alike. Understanding the principles in these books reveals that effective learning comes from a growth mindset, resilience in the face of failure, embracing challenges, and consistent, deliberate practice. Add to that the scientific challenges presented in Make It Stick, and you've got a solid formula for robust learning. In summary, the book offers two main takeaways. The first is a set of learning strategies for anyone who wants to learn, whether it's us or our kids. First off, focus on recalling new information from memory rather than just repeatedly reading it. Challenge yourself to remember what you've learned. Secondly, 
Space out your practice sessions. Don't rush to take a test right after you've learned something. Give it some time and then test yourself. Mix in different types of questions and subjects like humanities, math, English and even physical education. The book also provides some advice for educators. When you're teaching students how to learn, start by explaining the mechanics of learning. Make sure kids understand how memory retention works in their brains and share the insights from this book with them. Next, teach them the actual methods of effective learning. Lastly, the book talks about creating desirable difficulties. This means introducing challenges that are just hard enough to stretch the student, but not so hard that they become discouraged. The idea is to create the right level of difficulty to facilitate learning opportunities. The final takeaway is about ensuring transparency. After each assessment, it's crucial to offer feedback and clarify the objectives of the learning and the reason behind the test design. This open communication helps students understand where the teacher is coming from, fostering a sense of respect and trust that enhances the classroom's overall leadership. In summary, that's the essence of what this book has to offer. I'm convinced that if your child engages with this book, they'll find a renewed interest in exploring the unknown. Kids aren't scared of challenges, they're just scared of being bored or unengaged. I hope this book can offer your child effective learning strategies and inspire a more proactive and ambitious atmosphere within your family.